Hello everyone. Time once again for Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. Today we're in the book of Colossians. We began a verse by verse study through this book last time. We pick it up today in chapter 1, verse 7. So if you can get your Bible and open it up to the book of Colossians, that would be wonderful. As I've said many times, it's always best to follow along in your own Bible, if it is possible, as we study it together verse by verse. And speaking of that, the Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. And when you go there, the only thing you need is your Bible. Bring your Bible, have it open to whatever book you want to study, and click on that book, click on the chapter, open your Bible, listen, follow along, and study it with me verse by verse. That's at the Bible, verse by verse.com. You can't go wrong because the Bible is the most important thing in the world. That's at the Bible, verse by verse.com. Study from Genesis through Revelation using my audio Bible messages. Well, Let's get into the book of Colossians, and let's begin with prayer. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Last time we left off in verse number 6 of Colossians chapter 1. We were just starting to get into the word. Um, let's begin our reading in verse 3, and we'll just buzz right through this till we get to verse 7. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have for all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come unto you as it is as it has in all the world, talking about the gospel, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. Ye also learned of it from Epaphras, our dear dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. A faithful minister of Christ. That's Epaphras. He is a dear fellow servant and a faithful minister of Christ. He was useful because he was a servant primarily a servant of Jesus Christ. If a Christian, if you will serve Jesus Christ, if you are willing to serve instead of always looking to be served, if you are willing to set aside what makes you happy in order to make Jesus happy whenever the two are conflicting, if you are willing to give and to give of yourself, and put Jesus first, then God will work through you in ways that you could never even imagine. He will do more things through you than you could imagine for more people than you ever thought possible. And so, if you are a Christian, and you die, and you go stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and you see that much of your life has been wasted, It will be your fault and yours alone. Be a servant starting right now. Be a servant starting right this second, and your effort will not be wasted, and your life will not be lived in vain. Verse 8. Who, speaking of Epaphras, who also declared unto us, your love in the Spirit. These Colossians, they had love in the Spirit. And love in the Spirit is pure, undefiled, unselfish love. You get yourself filled with the Spirit of Almighty God, and He's going to start living and loving through you in the way that He wants to do it. And it may just amaze you how He does it. But anyone can be an on-fire servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that you can be the most on-fire Christian in the world starting right this second if you want to be. You can be right now if you want it. Anyone can serve Jesus with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Anyone 
And it's your choice. You can be that person. If you don't, that's up to you. If you don't, that's on you. Not on anybody. You can't blame anyone or anything else. You say, well, I'll just wait till my circumstances get a little bit better. No, 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 no. You serve Jesus with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You start right now in the midst of your circumstances as they are. You can do it. Anyone can be a modern version of the Apostle Peter as long as they're willing to go all out for Jesus, even though it might mean being crucified upside down. Anyone can be a modern version of the Apostle Paul, completely dedicated to the Lord God Almighty and to his son, Jesus Christ. All you have to do is what he did, and that's beat his body into subjection, lest after he preached to others, he himself would become a castaway. You can be that person. You don't have to be a preacher. You can be that, just totally sold out to Jesus Christ. You can be that person. Someone says, well, you know, I don't know. I don't know about that. Maybe I could be. I guess I could be, but I don't know, because I like, kind of like satisfying my body, to be honest with you. You know, I, I kind of like giving in to temptation. In fact, I do that more than I do what is right in the eyes of God. I know that, and I'm not really sure I want to quit. Well, then carry on. Carry on with your miserable, useless, to Almighty God existence. Carry on with your lukewarm existence and waste your life because that's what's going to happen. Totally up to you. Verse 9, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Spiritual wisdom, spiritual wisdom and understanding includes, now watch this, spiritual wisdom and understanding includes knowing what the Bible says and knowing how it applies to whatever situation you find yourself in. That's having spiritual wisdom and understanding. This verse talks about being filled with the knowledge of God's will. A lot of people want to know, what, what is God's will for me? That's the most often asked question to any preacher, probably. Preacher, how can I know God's will for me? This verse talks about being filled with the knowledge of God's will. When you are applying, now watch this, it's not that complicated, okay? When you are applying the Bible to what you do, and how you do it. When you apply the Bible to what you say. And you're applying the Bible to your attitude. Then you don't have to be concerned about finding God's will, mister. You're in it. Right now. When you know what the Bible says. And you know how to apply it to your life. And you're doing that then you have grabbed a hold of God's will, hook, line, and sinker, and all you have to do is hang on tight because God is driving. And he'll take you for a ride. And it'll, it, it'll be some bumpy roads, but he'll be with you all the way, and you'll have a good time with him in spite of any sufferings that you might have to go through. Verse 10. Let's read 9 and 10. For this cause we also, since today we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord in all pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. This is one of the most tremendous verses in all of the scriptures. And you've probably heard me say this hundreds of times. And every single time I said it, I was telling the truth. But you know what this is teaching? This is teaching that the more we know about God, and the more we apply his word to our life, 
the more we will get to know God, and then we'll have more to apply. And when we apply it, we will know God in a deeper way. See how that, see that, how that vortex goes? But it's not a sinking vortex, it's a rising vortex. And it all starts with applying the simple truths of God's word that you already know right now. That's where it begins. So that's why I said, you can be that on fire servant of Jesus Christ right now. You can start right now. You don't have to wait till you know more. It all starts with applying the simple truths of God's word that you already know right now. That's the ignition. That's the ignition that starts the spiritual engine in your soul, applying the word of God that you know right now. Don't wait till you know more about God and what he wants before you start living for him. Start applying the truth that you know right now. And that eventually will come. Verse 11. Strengthen with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long-suffering, with joyfulness. We need to be strengthened with all God's might, according to his glorious power. We need to be strengthened with all of God's might according to his glorious power. That means we need all the power of God that we can handle or we're going to fall flat on our faces. Verse 11 talks about patience. Verse 11 talks about long-suffering. And not feeling rotten about it, but instead doing it with joyfulness. Patience and long-suffering and doing it with joyfulness, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen because that's not natural unless, like this verse says, we are, we are empowered with the power of God. Then it can happen. Persevering in doing what is correct. In the eyes of Jesus Christ. You want to be on fire for Jesus? Persevere in doing what is correct. But having that and having patience and putting up with, with, with that which is wrong can only be accomplished in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that will only happen as we are ever growing in our walk with the Lord and striving to stay close to him. That is always the beginning point. And that is what we must persevere in doing, staying close to him. Because you see, if our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is solid, then I will tell you what is going to happen. You say, oh, well, if, I, if my relationship with Jesus Christ is solid, then, then I will be able to be patient and I will be able to do what he wants me to do. Wait a minute, that's kind of true, but kind of not true. If our relationship, which is where God wants our focus to be, if our relationship with Jesus is solid, then he will produce the patience that we need and that he wants us to have. If our relationship with Jesus is solid, then, then we will be able to put up with more bad than we ever thought possible. God, the Holy Spirit, will produce endurance to us. It is him. And as a result, we will keep living for Jesus and we'll keep doing the right thing in spite of all the sinful enticements and threats that may attack us. They will not face us. They'll slip right off of us like we were made of Teflon. Verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father who hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. I think I'm going to read this verse again because it says something that I'll bet many of you have never thought about and up until this point have not understood. So let me read verse 12 one more time carefully and listen carefully. Giving thanks unto the Father who hath made us meet, who has made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. How do we get to the place where we are acceptable to God? 
How do we get to the place where we are acceptable to God, acceptable in His sight? It is God the Father who makes us qualified, who makes us fit for that. We cannot do it ourselves. You see, we have all been disqualified for heaven, every single one of us. You know, if you feel arrogant about yourself over somebody else, you don't know as you ought to know. We have all been disqualified for heaven because we, all, we have all committed sin. And that disqualifies you. You say, how many? One. I just shocked many of you. One sin. One sin disqualifies us for heaven. You say, well, then who can get to heaven? Well, simple. Those who don't have any sins on their soul. One sin disqualifies us for heaven. The very first time you and I ever committed a sin in our entire life, we were immediately disqualified from heaven. And there is absolutely nothing that we can do to fix that. We have been disqualified for breaking the rules. You know how that goes. We've been kicked out of the game, as it were. But God has qualified those who have repented of their sin and received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Through Jesus Christ, he has made us fit for heaven. Through Jesus Christ, he has qualified us to go to heaven after we die instead of where we're headed, which is hell. It is God the Father who qualifies us through his Son, Jesus Christ. When we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, that's how it happens. There's no other way. 13. He hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. What a what an amazing verse this is. I didn't say this is the best verse that I've ever read in my life. But it could be. It could be. Let's read it again. It's so good. He hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. First of, first of all, we've got to find out who the us is. The us is who the Apostle Paul was writing to. He's writing to Christians. The us is Christians. Christians have been delivered from the power of darkness. And that power in darkness, power of darkness that we have been delivered from, is not just the road to hell. That's a huge part of it. But it also includes slavery to sin. We are delivered from the power of darkness. We have been delivered from slavery to sin. You know, if you are a Christian, don't you? Unless you have been told some silly, stupid, worldly thing, like you have to go through years and years of psychological or some other kind of counseling in order to get victory over sin. That is the biggest lie you will ever hear in your entire life. And if you go to a church that preaches that rot, shame on you. Get out of there. And don't you support any preacher that preaches that kind of nonsense. Oh, they come across as being so intellectual and so sophisticated. And that appeals to the flesh, you know. Christians have been delivered from the power of darkness. And that includes slavery to sin. And this was written long before there was any Christian counselors or any Christian psychologist. The fact of the matter is, and what this verse is saying, is that the devil cannot slap you around like a punching bag anymore. He can't do it. Unless you give him permission. Otherwise, he can't do it. You don't have to live in darkness. You don't have to live in moral rot, controlled by the ridiculous and warped reasoning, warped reasoning of the world that leads to frustration and failure. So often among lukewarm Christians who look to them, worldly trash that is promoted in churches in the name of sophistication and intellectualism and education, and all it is is ungodly, unbiblical rot, fit for the dunghill. You have been delivered 
from spiritual darkness. Inordinate behavior, sinful behavior that leads to frustration and failure among the lukewarm Christians and the unsaved of this world. You don't have to live like that. We don't have to live under the control of moral darkness if we are Christians. We don't have to live like a fool, not knowing our left hand from our right hand. People in the world grope around in the darkness looking for normal, and they don't find it because they're in that darkness. But when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and made a commitment to follow him, God installed a light bulb in our soul. And every time we take in the Word of God, that light gets brighter. That light is getting brighter and brighter as this message goes on because we are studying the Word of God together. And every time we take in the Word of God, our soul becomes brighter. Our knowledge of right and wrong increases. And consequently, we don't have to stumble along in life doing all sorts of stupid things that bring people to ruin. See, that's the problem with studying in the church. And that's the trouble with reading all these stupid Christian so-called how-to books. Read the Bible. Throw away the book. Read the Bible. Get rid of the workbooks. Get rid of the psychology workbooks. Get rid of the counseling. Get rid of them. Read the Bible. Get on your knees and pray. And read the Bible. The Holy Spirit will never lead you astray. And he'll give you the strength to do what you read. What he tells you he wants you to do. It'll come from reading the word. It'll come from your prayer. It'll be coming from spending time with him. You don't have to be a basket case. You don't have to live in ruin. I don't care what your problem is. Well, let's move on. This is a biggie. Verse 14. In whom, talking about his son, Jesus Christ, in whom, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood. What's redemption? Even the forgiveness of sin. How? Through his blood. And if you're reading an NIV or a New Living Translation or an English Standard Translation or the New American Standard Bible or the Holman Christian Standard Bible or any of the other modern versions, if you're reading any of them, then uh, take a look at that verse again and notice that that Bible that you're reading has removed the reference to the blood of Jesus Christ in verse 14. It has taken it out. Who do you think is behind that in light of the fact that we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Who do you think doesn't want you to know that? If you said Lucifer, the bad guy, Satan, you're right. Using corrupt scriptures, Satan has mounted a direct attack against the blood of Jesus Christ, which is the thing, according to verse 14, that saves people from their sins. And pastors all across this country and all across this world are unwittingly being used by Satan to steer people away from the pure truth using their false versions of Scripture, their perverted versions of Scripture. Someone says, well, does it? I mean, really, does it really matter? So what? It leaves the blood of Jesus Christ. I, so what? So, so, so what if they left a couple of words out? Does it really matter? Well, it matters to God. God says in Jeremiah 23, 35, and 36, it matters to him. Listen to what he says. What hath the Lord answered? And what hath the Lord spoken? Ye have perverted the words of the living God, of the Lord of hosts, our God. Yeah, it matters to him. You better believe it matters to him. The Bible says that Jesus has redeemed us by his blood. In other words, when he shed his blood on the cross, he ransomed us off the road to hell. That's exactly what that means. And he puts us on the path of heaven and he has done it through his blood that he shed on the cross. Well, someone says, well, why do we have to talk about the blood anyway? It's kind of gruesome. And what's the difference? Death is death. You you don't have to mention the word blood, do you? Why do we have to do that? What difference does it make? We have to talk about the blood because that's what God talks about. Plain and simple. And there is a huge difference between simply talking about the death of Christ 
and the shed blood of Christ. Because, because, God says that the life is in the blood, and it is the blood of Jesus Christ that gives us eternal life. The life is in the blood, and it is the blood of Jesus Christ that gives us eternal life. It, now, just think back to this, to the first Passover down in Egypt. Remember? You remember when the Israelites had to, had to slaughter the Passover lamb and apply the blood to the doorpost with the hyssop? And the death angel went by when it saw the blood? Remember that? It wasn't enough to simply kill the Passover lamb down in Egypt. That wasn't good enough. There's a huge difference between just the death of a sacrificial animal and the literally shedding and applying of the blood. It wasn't enough to simply kill the Passover lamb in Egypt. Its blood had to be applied to the doorpost in order to save the lives of the firstborn inside of the house. Its blood had to be applied. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. God talks over and over and over about the shedding of blood, especially the blood of Jesus Christ. So yes, the blood of Jesus Christ makes all the difference in the world. 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. You know, he, he is the firstborn of every creature. That doesn't mean... That doesn't mean that Jesus was the first person that God ever made because he was not made. Adam was the first person to ever be made, first human being. You say, well then, okay, if Adam was the first person to be made, then he must have existed before Jesus. No, no, no. The Son of God has always existed. He existed before he came to earth. He was there long before God created Adam. As a matter of fact, a little later on, we're going to see the Son of God is the one who created Adam. See, I thought he was born in, I thought he came into existence in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. No, no. That's when his humanity was born. That's when he was born, a human being. He was 100% God for all eternity past. He became 100% man, 100% human when he was conceived in Mary's womb. That was the beginning of the humanity part of him, but he has always existed in the past. Jesus, when it talks about Jesus being the firstborn, it's talking about the biblical sense of that word. Firstborn in Scripture means the preeminent one. The preeminent one. First in rank among all other family members. He's the one who's in charge. That's what it's talking about. Jesus is the one who's in charge. The one who provides, the one who instructs. And boy, that's Jesus right down to the smallest detail, isn't it? Jesus is the one who's in charge. Jesus is the one who provides. Jesus is the one who instructs. He is the firstborn, firstborn in rank, first in rank, the most important one. So Jesus is not created, and that's because he's God. He's the image of the invisible God. He's in charge, and we're out of time. But you can continue studying the Word of God, and I hope you do, at thebibleversebyverse.com. Please check it out. If you haven't begun a verse-by-verse -verse study through the entire Bible, right now, today, is a good time to start. Just click on the book of Genesis. Click on Genesis. Click on the first chapter. Open your Bible. Follow along and listen as I teach it verse-by-verse -verse at thebibleversebyverse.com. You can't go wrong. Can't go wrong. It's the Word of God, the most important thing on earth. It'll change your life because it'll draw you closer to Jesus. And if you're blessed by the Word, please keep in mind that I am not underwritten by a large church or denomination. I've been doing this for over 30 years. This is just a faith ministry where I give out the Word of God as I always have. I've never changed, never. I've always done it the same from Genesis through Revelation, verse by verse, and I've given out as clearly, as straightforwardly as I possibly can. And I've always depended on God to move the hearts of those that he has blessed and fed, to move the hearts of those people to give and support this ministry and to pray for this ministry. And I would certainly appreciate you doing that. And you can give right there at thebibleversebyverse.com. Just click on the donate button at the top of the front page and give as the Lord may lead. That's at the thebibleversebyverse.com. Like I said, I'm out of time. We'll pick it up right here next time. Until then, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.